Shalom, I just want to make a little bit of a video about the rapture. Um, for those of you who don't know what the rapture is, uh, rapture is just a fancy word that is used to describe an event that is uh, spoken of in Scripture. Uh, in particular, one of the key passages when talking about the rapture is First, Thess First Thessalonians, excuse me, chapter four, where Paul says that you know uh, the Lord will descend from heaven uh, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we, which are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and we will meet the Lord in the air, and, and we will be forever with the Lord. Now, in the mid, early to mid-1990s, uh, I took a, a course on Bible prophecy. And so uh, the course that I took was uh, a pre-trib kind of uh, course. Now, again, to explain what I mean by pre-trib, the idea of the rapture is, uh, for a lot of evangelical conservative Christians, is that basically at any given moment, um, Jesus will come back and rapture his people up out of the earth in a kind of a secret takeaway, like a, a secret snatch away. Um, they use certain scriptures to talk about that, such as, you know, there'll be two in the field, one will be taken, the other left, there'll be two in the bed, one will be taken, the other left, there'll be two grinding at the millstone, one will be taken and the other left. And so the teaching goes on to say, when Jesus comes to take his people out of the earth, that, be that is the beginning of the tribulation. The tribulation is a period of seven years that is a period of great, great trouble on the earth. We're talking about natural disasters. We're talking about uh, pestilences, uh, diseases. We're talking about um, famines and, and all kinds of stuff like that where the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. So the idea is Jesus comes back, takes his people, to spare them from the wrath of God. And during the seven years where, where, uh, when the, the people on earth are suffering like never before, uh, the people of God will be in heaven feasting uh, in a kind of a wedding ceremony called the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, the, you know, there'll be all these Christians up in heaven and they'll all be you know, having a wonderful, glorious time of, you know, great big heavenly barbecue and uh, basically just, uh, you know, feasting and, and having a great time while the earth is in turmoil like never before. Then at the end of that seven years, Jesus says basically, okay, everybody, we're going back to earth and we're going to we're going to take care of the evil. We're going to wipe out the Antichrist. We're going, to, we're, going to, you know, we're going to wipe out all the nations that are against God. And I'm going to set up my kingdom on earth. And you're coming back with me. And they, you know, they use the scripture, for example, in Jude, where they said the Lord comes back with ten thousands of his saints, ten thousands of, of his holy ones uh, to, uh, to execute judgment upon the earth and so on and so forth. So we got the pre-trib rapture is... Jesus comes back at any time and basically kind of sneaks his people away. Nobody knows. All of a sudden, people just disappear, you know. And, uh, and so they go away to uh, have a wonderful feast of the Lord, the marriage supper of the Lamb, while the whole earth is turned into basically hell on earth. And uh, at the end of the seven years, Jesus brings everybody, all, everybody back and, and wages war against the uh, godless nations and against the Antichrist and, and uh, wins and sets up his kingdom. Okay, so I was taught that. Uh, I believed that for a period of time until I actually started studying the scriptures for myself and uh, started, you know, uh, challenging some of these beliefs. Now, I believe that the truth always prevails. You can challenge the truth, and if you challenge it, you know, from a sober mind and looking at the scriptures the way they're supposed to be interpreted, then the truth will always stand. Okay? 
So I did that, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to share with you what I found, and uh, I know that uh, a lot of you are going to be very blessed by what I share because what I share with you will bring things down to earth in a more uh, and a level of understanding and will strengthen your faith and you will say, hey, yeah, that makes a whole lot more sense. Okay, so we cannot talk about the rapture. We cannot talk about the end times without at least touching on the notorious chapter of Matthew chapter 24, the end time chapter, okay? The, the chapter that talks about Jesus' second coming and the, the end of the age, the end of the world, so to speak. So it starts out, and I'm just going to quickly go through this very, very quickly. It, it starts out with the disciples asking him, uh, when, uh, let me see here, when, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Jesus starts out by saying, take heed that no man deceive you. Right off the bat, first thing, priority there's going to be a lot of deception out there. And I submit to you, it is in the church. It's not from the world. It's from the so-called church leaders, okay? Jesus said very clearly, first thing, priority, take heed that no man deceives you. So that makes it all the more important for us to really get into the scriptures, for us to really challenge everything we hear, not from a point of view, not from a bad you know, uh, attitude or a uh, bad perspective, but just a perspective to say, hey, you know what? Nobody, is, I mean, a lot of these preachers that are on TV, that are on the radio, that are in the pulpits, that are in churches today, I mean, I, who can say that everything they said, everything they say is perfect, okay? We got to challenge what they say, okay? So, First thing is, take heed that no, no man deceive you. Very, very important. Matthew uh, chapter 24, verse 5, Jesus goes on to say, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And the word Christ here is Christos in the Greek, Mashiach in the Hebrew, which means anointed one. So uh, later on we'll read as well that Jesus warn his disciples there's going to be many people many people many false Christs, many false anointed ones okay that will come along uh, he says here uh, you'll hear of wars rumors of wars then he starts talking about trouble here verse 6 verse 7 nation will rise against nation there'll be famines pestilences earthquakes in different places verse 8 these are the beginning of sorrows uh, speaking of like uh, sorrows here me is a word for in the original manuscripts and the, the word for like birth pangs where these things will become more and more frequent and more and more intense uh, you shall be delivered up they shall kill you okay uh, you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake um, it reminds me of a of a preacher uh, that said that if if Jesus preached the way a lot of preachers preach today, he would never have been crucified. So the truth uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a message that, uh, that, that sometimes hurts, if not always hurts. And uh, people will hate it. People will hate it. If you're preaching the truth, if you're preaching against sin, if you're preaching repentance, if you're preaching you know, holiness and righteousness, if you're a preacher of righteousness, people will hate it. Jesus said... You will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then uh, shall many be offended. Okay, we can't be, uh, here we are, many shall be offended. Okay, we can't be too concerned about offending people. We got to be more concerned about preaching the word of God, preaching the scriptures, preaching the truth. Okay, if we are concerned about offending, Offending people, we're not going to get into, we're not going to join this group that Jesus is talking about. We can't be too overly sensitive. Oh, you know what? We're going to turn people away from Christ. Oh, we're going to turn people away from Jesus. Jesus didn't worry about turning people away from him. He spoke it as it is. And yeah, many people hated him and many people tried to kill him over and over again and they finally did. Um, false prophets shall arise, deceive many. You know, he's, he's, so he's, go, he's, he's going on here. He's explaining how it's going to get worse and worse. 
The love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Here we go. It's a conditional salvation here. He that, it, that shall endure to the end shall be saved. Okay? Very important. Um, the gospel of the, of the kingdom shall be preached to all nations, then that shall the end come. And then he gets into, in verse 15 here, he gets into talking about the abomination that causes desolation. That's another whole topic for another whole video. Um, talking about how bad it's going to be. You know, you don't want to even go back to your house. It's going to be really bad. The, the, the wrath of God that's going to be poured out. You, you don't even want to look back. You don't even want to get, you know, turn back to get your stuff. You want to just run for it, okay? Um, and then Jesus said here in verse 21, Then shall be great tribulation. Tribulation is horrible turmoil. Great tribulation is even more. He says, such as was not since the beginning of the world, no, nor ever shall be. Wow, that's a very powerful and a very sobering statement. Except those days be shortened, no flesh should be saved. In other words, nobody, unless God cuts these days short, nobody's going to survive. I mean, take it for what you think it means. A lot of people might think, you know, a lot of people have heard it uh, preached that it's uh, talking about nuclear warfare. It could be talking about biological warfare. It could be talking about just simply the wrath of God being poured out. That's, you know, God says, that's enough. I'm not going to let it go anymore. Um, if any man say to you, lo, here's the Christ, believe it not, for there be many, uh, here we are, for there shall arise false Christs, false prophets. Okay, again, I'm not going into a lot of detail here. I can do that in another video. I can do that in another teaching. But I'm, what I want to say here is that uh, he's going on and on explaining it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Pretty, pretty bad. Um, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from, from heaven, and the powers of, of heaven shall be, shall be shaken. That's talking about the powers of the like, stars and, the, and the, you know, the planets and such. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and, shall, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with, with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Here, now here we go. This is talking about when Jesus finally comes back to the earth. He's going to send his angels out all over the earth to gather up his people. So this is like the rapture, the end time rapture. Now I know a lot of people believe that there's going to be like almost like two raptures. One at the beginning of the tribulation and seven, then seven years later after the tribulation, which this is obviously talking about here. Um, and then uh, he shall send his angels and gather the, his elect, meaning the, you know, the chosen people, the, 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 the people that are saved, God's precious people that are God's people, that are his people. So he goes into talking about, it's like a fig tree. When you see it starting to bud, you know that something, you know, the summer's near. When you see these things starting to come to pass, you know that, it, that, that uh, the end is near, so to speak. Uh, but, the, but of that day and hour n uh, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Here's a, here's a verse. Uh, this is just a little bit of a rabbit trail. This is a verse that a lot of people just totally ignore and totally dance around or explain away. There's a lot of people throughout the ages that have claimed to, you know, they're date setters. You know, Jesus is coming back at this date, on this year, on this day. If anybody that says that, I'm telling you, anybody that says that, is wrong. They are not telling the truth. Jesus said very here, no one knows the day or the hour. Now, here's a key verse right here. Now, this is what I want to get into. Um, verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Very significant point here. For as in the days of that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the, the day that Noah entered the ark and, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall 
also the coming of the Son of Man be. Two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be, gather, shall be grinding in the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you don't know what hour the, your Lord comes. Okay, so basically a lot of people use this particular passage to, to say this is talking about the pre-trib rapture. When one will be taken and the other left, there was like two people doing something. All of a sudden, one person disappears and the other one's left, left behind. Okay. Um, so let's look at another gospel, the gospel of Luke, to really get a little bit more insight because Luke writes a little bit more than what Matthew writes here uh, about what it's talking about. One shall be taken and the other left. Luke chapter 17, verse 22. The apostles, uh, the disciples, uh, uh, he said to his disciples, excuse me, the day has come when you desire to see the Son of Man and you will not see it. Uh, and then he goes on to explain basically exactly what Matthew was saying. You know, if someone says, look here, look there. Oh, Jesus is over here. Jesus came back. Look, he's over there. Oh, turn on the TV. Look, you'll see he's, he's back now. Oh, go to the internet. You go to the videos. Go to this website. You'll see that he's back now. No. Jesus said, you know, as the lightning is from, uh, as the lightning is, it's, it's a visible, more or less, you know, in a, in a, what would you say, in an analogy. The lightning, is a visible, the lightning is visible to more or less everybody. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to be visible. You, no one's going to have to say to you, uh, oh, Jesus, come, did you hear Jesus returned? I mean, if anybody says that, he, I guarantee you, he didn't return. When he comes, everybody's going to know it. Everybody's going to know it. And that's basically what he's saying here. Don't let anybody say, oh, he, look, here he's over here, or there he's over there. No, no, no. Everybody's going to know it. So here we, go, here we are right here. Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Again, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the, in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking, marrying, giving to marriage. Basically, they were living life as, no, as per normal until the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat and drink and, and uh, build and all that kind of stuff. I find it very interesting that Jesus brings this up in with talking about the, last, the latter days because, you know, uh, Peter said, look at Sodom. Jude said the same thing. Look at Sodom. That is an example of what is to come. Jesus says, look at Lot in Sodom. This is, a, this is an example of what is to come. So the wrath of God that will be poured out, it will be similar to the, to the wrath of God that was poured out on Sodom. So he uses Sodom uh, as an example of the end times, okay? Thus it sh even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day... Um, Basically, he says, if you're on the house, don't go down and get it. If you're in the field, don't go back. Don't, it, it, the wrath of God is going to be so strong. The, uh, the trouble that's going to be falling upon the, the, the earth, uh, you know, in a, uh, uh, s saying it very mildly, uh, is going to be so bad that uh, you don't even want to go back to your house to get whatever's in there because you just want to run for it. Um, then he says in verse 34 here, this is, this is the point I want to get at. I tell you, in that night there shall be two in one bed. Now here it says, uh, there's a word that says men, that's in italics, which tells you that it's not in the original manuscript. So in the original manuscripts, uh, Jesus said there'll be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other shall be left. There'll be two women grinding together. One will be taken, the other left. Two in, in the field. Oh, one will be taken and the other left. Now, this is key here. Luke chapter 17, verse 37. Then they, the disciples, answered and said to him, Where, Lord? Where? What are you talking about? They'll be taken. I mean, good question. Good, good question. And he answered and he said, Wheresoever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now, I confess to you, and I believe that most people that are these, you know, the people that believe in the pre-trib rapture, mid-trib rapture and such, they, their mind fogs over when it comes to this verse. I'm here to show you what this verse actually means. Now, when Jesus said in the context of, you know, what do you mean, Lord, one will be taken, the other left? Jesus just said, it, it, basically, wherever the body is, wherever there's a dead body, there the eagles will be gathered together. Generally speaking, Jesus is talking about death. He's talking about death, okay? 
when, it's ta- when he says one will be taken, he's talking about death, you know. Uh, let's go back again to uh, Matthew chapter 24. We're talking about the flood. When the flood came and killed all of the sinners, it says that they went... It doesn't say basically that they died in the, in the flood, but they were took away. They, they took them all away, okay? So again, this whole uh, phrase, being taken away, is re- referring to death. Let me prove it to you in a final uh, passage here, which is you're going to be really amazed at. This is Isaiah chapter 57, verse 1. The righteous perishes, okay? Dies. That's what it means. The righteous man dies. And no one lays it to heart. In other words, you don't really understand. You don't really think about it very much. The merciful men are taken away. Okay? Again, in the context of dying, none considers that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Let me say this again. The righteous perishes. No one lays it to heart. No one understands. The merciful men are taken away. How? In death, obviously. Uh, And none considers that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Okay, so when the verses that are talking about two will be, you know, grinding in the mail, one will be taken, the other left, two will be in the bed, one will be taken, the other left, you know, so, so on and so forth. Jesus is talking about just a general analogy, a general way of speaking, um, a general, what would you call it, um, a figure of speech, just saying that, you know, people are going to die off. Now, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, we had lots of, you know, we had a fair amount of righteous people. There was the seed of Seth, you know, and Seth, all the way from Seth to Noah and, and, and their descendants and their families. They were the righteous ones. The Bible says, the scriptures say that God waited until all of the righteous, one, all the righteous people died until the flood came, you know, except, of course, Noah and his family, which were safe in the ark. So there will be that select few that will be going through the tribulation. But what you need to understand is Methuselah was the last one to die. Methuselah, the the name Methuselah itself means his death shall bring. His death shall bring. So we look at, let's say, you know, we got so many hundred or so many thousand people that are righteous and they all have to die off first. And the last one to die, the last one of the righteous people that won't go on the ark to die was Methuselah. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Methuselah, when he died, that's when it started raining. That's when God's wrath started to pour out. So today, if you look at it, in, you know, especially in developed nations, in, in Europe and in North America and in other de- developed nations as well, you will notice that churches are slowly closing up and that a lot of these churches are just full of, you know, older people. You know, the younger ones are not so inclined to be part of the faith, be part of the practice of faith. It is the older ones, and they are the ones that are dying off. You see it all over the place. This, you know, church is closing. Why are they closing? You know, because the younger people are not taking the older people's place. Uh, they're off doing their own thing, and the, the older people are just slowly dying off until finally they just have to close the church. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in the time when the righteous people are dying off. They're dying off, okay? As time goes on, more and more of the righteous are dying, dying off and leaving this earth. They're being taken away. They're being taken away. Not in the rapture as you have been taught or as, as you have been told, been led to understand, but in a pre-trib rapture, if you will, of 
death being taken away. Now, do I believe in the rapture when Jesus comes back and everybody is going to be caught up together with him in the clouds? Absolutely. But that's going to happen at the end. That's going to happen at the end, okay? The, the righteous people are all dying off. And they're actually dying off at a pretty fast rate, really. Um, you know, things are changing really fast. And that's because the righteous people are dying off. They're not around anymore to be that salt in the earth, you know. Uh, and so we, are, we will be left with a few of the righteous ones that will be on the ark, so to speak, safe from God's wrath. Uh, but there will be, it will be very few. Think about it. I mean, think of how many people on the earth uh, died in the flood of Noah. It was only one family, only one family that survived. So there you have it. There is the rapture as you have never heard it before. This is what the scriptures say. And it makes a whole lot more sense than just all of a sudden people just all of a sudden vanishing, okay? Uh, no, we see it happening right now. Uh, we see it happening right under our nose, okay? And uh, yeah, they are dying off. And when the last of the righteous ones die, uh, you know, except for those very few, very, very few that will go through the tribulation, protected, of course, um, that's when God's wrath will be poured out. You know, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the only thing that kept God back from destroying Sodom and Gomorrah was that one family in there, Lot. Lot and his wife, you know, and, and, and his family. Um, you know, a lot of people today, they don't realize that the only thing that's holding God's wrath back today are the very few righteous people left within your nation, within your cities. So thank God for them. We need to bless uh, the, the people of God. We need to um, uphold them in prayer. And we need to love them. The preachers of righteousness, those who preach against sin, preach repentance, preach holiness, and servant, you know, to be a servant of God in holiness, righteousness, and truth. So there's a, uh, another good nugget for you to, uh, to chew on, to meditate upon. Once again, don't forget to visit my blog, ChristopherEnoch.org. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe. Thanks for watching.